In this video, I am going to discuss the real science behind free energy and zero-point energy, and like all my other videos, I'll be giving you the straight physics, explained in terms that normal everyday people can understand. If you don't understand something I say, try to go look it up for yourself first, and if you still don't understand, just ask me by typing a question in the comments below, and if I have time, and I think the question is valid, I will answer it. What is zero-point energy? Zero-point energy is real science, while free energy is fringe science because it's never been experimentally proven to work without violating the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics is an expression of the universal law of increasing entropy, stating that the entropy of an isolated system which is not in equilibrium will tend to increase over time, approaching a maximum value at equilibrium. This is partially derived from Newton's law of inertia. An object at rest will stay at rest unless an outside force is applied. When there are unbalanced forces on an object, it causes the object to move. This means that whenever an object moves, its motion or change in acceleration is always due to an unbalanced forces acting upon the object. But more important than the law of inertia is the law of conservation of energy. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It simply changes form. It also likes to change form from a less ordered, more to from a less into a less ordered, more chaotic state. So if you have an, or, an ordered state, it tends to um, go toward a less ordered state. So say you have all the gas molecules of one type on one side of the room and all the gas molecules of another type on the other side of the room, they would eventually disperse themselves evenly into each other and mix due to the law of increasing entropy. In every mechanical or electrical system, such as those that use electromagnetic electromagnets, some of the energy is always converted into heat, and less friction can be totally eliminated. Bose-Einstein condensation, uh, for example, superconductors and superfluids, are the only known ways to achieve this. However, keeping them supercooled is an energy-consuming process in and of itself. Another interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics states that heat cannot spontaneously flow from a material at lower temperature to a material at higher temperature. This is because heat is the same thing as internal kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the kin energy of motion. Uh, internal means that it, it is contained. So internal kinetic energy is just a measure of how fast the molecules or, or atoms are jiggling or flying through space, probably bouncing off each other. Uh, so when you heat something up, you cause the atoms to shake faster and harder, or move around faster and harder. Uh, when you cool something down, you cause the atoms to shake slower. Take an ice cube, for example. Ice is just dihydrogen oxide, H2O, in the solid state of matter. This is where the atoms have been cooled down to the point where they stick together. Think of atoms as tiny magnets, and when you heat them up, they start bouncing off one another because they move around more and become less sticky. Uh, so when the ice begins to melt, what is happening on the molecular level is that the H2O molecules begin to jiggling fast enough where they start to break apart and sort of slide around, but they still keep stuck to each other somehow, a little bit of stickiness. So they kind of slide around on each other. And this is what causes surface tension in water. Is this, they're still attracted to one another, but they're sort of sliding around. And if you heat the molecules up a little more, they bounce off each other with too much energy for them to stick together. And this is what we call the gaseous state of matter. This is also conceptually explains why heat cannot spontaneously travel from cold to hot, because the hot molecules will always jiggle the slow ones into moving faster, or bounce them around more. So if the temperature can be thought of as a scale of how fast the molecules are jiggling, what happens when you cool something down to the point where the atoms stop jiggling altogether? Surely we can't cool them down any further than this point, because anyone knows you can't go slower than stop. This hypothetical point is called absolute zero, negative 275.15 degrees Celsius. And I say hypothetical because nobody has been able to actually cool something down this cold. Scientists have come very close, but no one has actually been able to reach absolute zero. This is due to a quantum mechanical principle known as the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Usually math equations turn a lot of viewers away, but this one is important, and it's really a lot simpler, simpler than it first looks. The term on the right is h-bar over 2, Planck's constant over 4 pi. The term on the left can never get smaller than this, because it must always be greater than or equal to the term on the right. The term on the left reads delta p, delta meaning change in, and p for meaning momentum. So delta p is change in momentum times the change in position. 
x or y or z depending on which position you're talking about it moving in what this equation essentially means is that we can only know a particle's position and momentum to within a degree of Planck's constant over 4 pi this says that as soon as we know the exact position of an atom its momentum changes and this is definitely true because in order to look at an atom we see and see where it is you have to bounce a photon or light particle off of it and then detect that photon with an eye or optical sensor of some sort but when that photon bounced off the atom it transferred some of its momentum to the particle or the atom changing its momentum and thus its position so you only knew where it was you don't know where it is anymore because by looking at it you change the state of it Heisenberg developed this principle by using a series of statistical probability matrices. The Schrodinger equation amounts, amounts to the same thing, but only Schrodinger used wave functions to derive his model as opposed to the matrix approach that Heisenberg took. Again, they both amount to the same thing, and that is that the laws of quantum mechanics are probabilistic in nature. Now, this is why Einstein didn't like quantum mechanics. He said, God does not play dice with the universe. Well, apparently, sometimes he does, because half of thermodynamics is based on statistical mechanics. So if the individual shaking of the atoms can be cooled down to the point where the atoms stop moving entirely, we would also, therefore, know its exact position, and due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there would be a violation, and the atom's momentum would then, therefore, have to change in order to satisfy the principle. Basically, the atom would go back to vibrating just outside the h-bar, or 2 over 2 limit of, of smallness, or the electron, or whatever the particle was that you were considering. To increase the particle's momentum requires energy, and this energy comes from nothing, seemingly. So we call this energy the zero-point energy, because when we cool something down to absolute zero, this energy comes out of nowhere and says, no, no, you're not getting to absolute zero. You can't get this cold. You can only get this close, but you can't get any closer than that. And you can get cl a little bit closer than that, but you can never get you can never actually get there. It's it's like a theoretical uh, infinity or a, an asymptote. So the only way to tap into zero point energy is to cool something to absolute zero. Unfortunately, it takes such massive amounts of energy in order to actually do that. It makes this absolutely useless as a source of power or energy, like a lot of these other devices out there. That you get less energy. You always get less energy back than you put in. You you can never get more back than you put in. It's the laws of physics. This isn't. I mean, this is simple science here. You should know this, people. You shouldn't be fooled by these internet hoaxes. I mean, I've, after viewing pretty much every video on YouTube dealing with free energy, such as the Race to Zero Point and that compilation that shows about 100 different claimed free energy devices, of course, none of them work because people who made them can't explain how their device produces free energy without violating the second law of thermodynamics. Everything in nature moves toward a less ordered, uh, I mean, a, a less ordered, more chaotic state. You can't go in reverse. It, everything moves toward a balanced state. Magnets are only a potential field. You have to put energy in in order to get energy out, and you can never get more energy back than you started with. When you use an electromagnet to turn the magnets on and off at certain times, this electromagnetic energy comes from the electricity traveling through the wire, and some of that energy is always lost to friction because from some resistance in the wire. As the, as the electricity travels through the wire, some of it's always converted into heat, so you're always losing energy. You can never be creating more energy, or there's no way to create energy or any, any serious way that I've ever seen, except for one. And now that I've turned all my viewers away by telling them the truth of, about the physics behind free energy and debunking half of those hoax bullshit claims out there, I'm going to attempt to redeem myself and re-grab those viewers' attention with a remarkable concept for producing a constant voltage without violating the second law of thermodynamics. A so-called infinite battery. Stay tuned. It's coming soon. Now that I've turned half of my viewers away by telling the truth about the physics behind free energy, I'm going to attempt to redeem myself and re-grab those viewers' attention with a remarkable concept for producing a constant voltage without violating the second law of thermodynamics, a so-called infinite battery. 
Basically, there are trillions of electromagnetic waves traveling around and through us at any given time, all different frequencies, all different, all different amplitudes. Take a radio, for example. The electrons inside of a metal, the metal of a radio antenna, are constantly bombarded with all these different frequencies of electromagnetic waves. These cause the electrons inside the antenna to oscillate up and down at the frequency of the waves hitting it. A radio's tuning device is simply a capacitor, which varies its capacitance frequency when you turn the tuning knob allowing only specific frequencies to be fed through. But basically you can move your head out the way and put um, a radio where your head used to be so therefore that's proof that these waves are going through your, our bodies right now. They're going everywhere. They're all over. We can't see them because they're, they're different frequency than our eyes can see but they're, we're constantly being bombarded with all these different uh, frequency electromagnetic waves at all the time. Now the trick is to turn all these into a coherent a coherent stream and to get energy from them somehow. So in electrons there's what is called in electronics there's what is called a diode, which is made of positively and negative doped silicon plates which touch each other. The electric current traveling across a diode can only flow from positive to negative. If you run the current the opposite way, negative to positive, the diode separates from the electron interactions and the materials inside and it flips the switch to off basically. This is different than a light emitting diode. A light emitting diode will emit light across if you hook it up the same if the, the right way but if you reverse polarize a light emitting diode it becomes a light detector kind of interesting so basically current can only travel across a diode in one way and this is the same circuit that they have inside those uh, shake up flashlights without the that have no batteries they just have a magnet inside and you shake them up most things run forever so here's the deal. There's a special type of quasi-crystal where the unit cell is like a tiny nano circuit of nanodiodes which only allow electrons to flow in one direction through the crystal. Random electromagnetic waves entering the crystal will cause the electrons in the crystal to oscillate at whatever frequency they're hit with, same as the electrons inside the radio antenna, and as long as they're free electrons. But when they do, they find that their direction is blocked one way because of the semiconductors. Uh, the whole crystal is made out of semiconductors which only allow electricity to flow across this thing in one way, the entire circuit, the entire crystal. So when these waves come in, they, they take this free electron, it rides one half of the wave, and then when the other half of the wave tries to dip it back down again, it gets blocked by the, the, uh, by the diodes inside the crystal structure and can't go back down. So it only absorbs one half of the wavelength, which basically propagates all these little atoms across the crystal in a coherent stream. And it basically just takes the energy right out of the electromagnetic radiation which permeates through all space and time, uh, more strongly so in direct sunlight of course, because we're getting more, more direct energy from the sun. It will produce much more higher voltage in direct sunlight. It's kind of like a photovoltaic cell, only just the most advanced photovoltaic cell you could possibly imagine. It's photovoltaic cells are typically 20% efficient at best. Uh, this would be almost 90% efficient. I don't know the exact number, but this allows this allows the crystal basically to produce a constant voltage, seemingly from nothing. But I've proven that the energy doesn't come from nothing. It can't come from nothing. That would violate physical laws that we just went over in the last video. But this energy comes from electromagnetic energy that's already there. It's all around us. It just provides us a way to, to harness this random energy and convert it into a form that's more usable to us. Uh, in this case, electrical voltage. Uh, since we are only absorbing one half of the wavelength, and since not all waves are polarized in the proper direction, less than a third, maybe less than a fourth of the total ambient electromagnetic energy gets converted into electrical voltage. So the amperage is small, but it's comparable to an alkaline electrochemical battery of the same size. The great part is you never have to replace it, and it will work better than a conventional battery in direct sunlight. And It's just in the dark, where it's just running off of radio waves and microwaves and, and infrared waves and all these other types of waves that are traveling through space and time it doesn't work quite as well as it would work in direct sunlight. So there you have it. There's a scientific proof of concept and if you have a refutation of it I'd like to hear it. And I'll be waiting to hear some offers from people who want the formula for manufacturing these quasi-crystal nanodiode batteries or would like to discuss the possibility of funding a startup company a company to you know start begin building a silicon refinery refinery able to produce the 99.999999 percent pure silicon required for the first stage of the manufacturing process
So questions, comments, you know what to do. I expect this video to be highly controversial, so rate it whatever you think it deserves. Thanks for watching.